those of you who are, are listening to us online, we welcome you. For those that are already on the conference call, we, we are praising God for you. Amen. Amen. Um, Pastor Paul and I are trying to do this tonight on this technology. I'm going to close my Facebook so that uh, it will broadcast faster and all in sync. Oh, my goodness. I just went back to the blog talk. I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Oh, hallelujah. Again, welcome, everybody, to the God in the Midst radio broadcast, Get em Radio, the Friday Night Lights edition with Pastor Mark McCoy and Pastor Paul McCoy. And tonight we're going to talk about the seven last words of Jesus Christ on the cross. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for all that you are. You're an awesome God. You're a wonderful God. You're a glorious God. You're a magnificent God. You're a merciful God. You're a loving God. You're a forgiving God. Oh, God, you're long-suffering. God, we could just go on and on talking about how good you are. You are a holy God, holy, 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 and we worship you and we praise you on this night, this Good Friday. Thank you, Lord, for another Good Friday. Lord, on that Friday night when he died, it was a bad Friday, but, but now we call it a good Friday because we know that three days later, Jesus got up out of that grave with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. Lord, we now plead the blood over this broadcast right now. Everybody that is listening, bless them, Lord, their families, bless their communities, bless their states and their countries. Those that are going to listen to this recording later, Lord, we just lift you up and give you praise for them right now, God. And Lord, let this word be a word of encouragement tonight. Let it be a word that not only encourages, but let it also be a word that somebody might be saved. Thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your anointing on us tonight. Thank you, Lord, for, for everything that you provided. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All amen. right, everybody. Ooh, if, if technology is working like it's supposed to, you should see my face and maybe even Pastor Paul's face at the same time. And on, you should also see our outline in our scriptures for this lesson. Glory to God. I can't wait to go back and review this myself. So at this time, at this time, uh, we're going to start off this lesson. Hallelujah. Uh, this, this, this Good Friday, we're going to talk about the seven last words of Jesus on the cross. Jesus died on the cross to redeem mankind and, 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 and to save us from sin because of his love for us. As, as recorded in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in, in, in the Holy Bible, Jesus Christ was mocked, he was scorned, he was tortured, and, and, and with all of that, he carried his cross up Villa Del Rosa's road. He carried his cross all through, Jeru uh, through Jerusalem up to Calvary's Hill, to that place they call the, 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 the Gargatha, the skull. I mean, he carried his cross. And then he was hung there. Between two common things, he suffered in, in indescribable pain. Tonight, we're going to recall the things that he said on the church. We say it on the cross to the church, to all of us. There, there, there on the cross, uh, uh, some have, 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 have came and put together 14 stops that Jesus went through before going on the cross. Number one, Pilate condemned Jesus to death. Number two, Jesus took up his cross. Three, he, 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 he falls the first time. Jesus meets his sorrowful mother. 
is number four. Number five, sign. Help him carry the cross. Then a young lady, six, clean his face. Number seven, he failed a second time. Number eight, Jesus counseled the woman of Jerusalem. Then number nine, he, he, he falls the third time. Oh, y'all got to hear these stations of the cross. Jesus got there, and, and, and Jesus was stripped of his garment. That's number 10. And number 11, Jesus is nailed to the cross. Number 12, hallelujah. Jesus died on that cross. Number 13, our Lord is taken down from the cross. Number, uh, number 13, I mean, and then number 14. Christ is laid in the tomb. Now, we're going to look at the seven last words he expressed on the cross. The first word that he expressed, the first expression was, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth is looking down from that cross just after he was crucified between those two criminals. He sees the soldiers mocking him and scorning him and torturing him. They were the ones that, that nailed him to the cross. Probably remember those who sent this in, Caiaphas and the high priest and, and the Sanhedrin and Pilate realized it was out of envy that he handed over Jesus. But Jesus also thinking about the apostles and companions who has deserted them when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Peter denied him three times before the rooster crows. He, he was exhibiting a fickled faith. All of Jerusalem demanded that Jesus be crucified and the rabbis be set free. Now, does he act angrily? No, no, no. At the height of his physical suffering, his love prevailed. And he asked his father, forgive them. Forgive them, Lord. Oh, there's so much great irony in Jesus asking, Father, forgive them. But it was for this very sacrifice on the cross that mankind is able to be forgiven. Oh, hallelujah. He tells us we, we ought to forgive our trespasses and we forgive those who trespass against us. And when Peter asked him at another time, how many times should I forgive somebody? And Jesus answered, 70 times, which means to forgive them in perfection. He forgave the paralytic. He forgave the sinful woman. He forgave the adulteress. He forgave all of them and told the people when they were trying to stone the adulterer, he that has no sin cast the first stone. That is to say, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all need forgiveness. And so when Jesus said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them because they don't understand what they're doing. They have no clue. Every time we sin, God is, is Jesus Christ is 
going to the Father, interceding on our behalf, because now he's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, and he's saying, give them. But they know not what they do. They know when we sin, we know, we don't know how bad we hurt the Lord's heart. So, at the Last Supper, Jesus tells them, drink of a cup. Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. And even after his resurrection, his first act was to commission his disciples to forgive. Listen, listen to John chapter 20, verse 22 and 23. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. My brothers and my sisters, we need to learn the forgiveness that God has. We need to exercise that forgiveness that Jesus gave on the cross. Too many people are walking around thinking that, that, that they are privileged and, and nobody should do them that way. It does not matter what people do to you. What matters is that you forgive them like Jesus forgave us. Oh, hallelujah. And if you don't forgive, it's like drinking poison and thinking the person that you ought to forgive is going to die. The person you mad at, it don't work that way. Because God told us we reap what we sow. God told us that vengeance is mine, said the Lord. So we don't have to worry about that. Our job is to forgive them in our heart, not waiting on an apology, but just forgive them. As you do that, he says, also pray. Them who despitefully misuse you. Pray for them who persecute you. Pray for them who consider you their enemy. And when you pray for them, it'll be like hot coals on their head. Oh, if I had time tonight, if I, I, I could tell you some story well, I have had to forgive people without an apology. God had me praying for them and took care of them. Oh, hallelujah. I say to you, Jesus said, forgive him, for we know not what we do. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, Pastor. Paul, you can inject or you can move on to the next word. Amen. Amen. We, um, as always, we want to give honor to God who was ahead of our life. Um, right now, I may be heard on the conference line, but I don't think I'm going to be seen on the live while I'm dealing with, while we're um, dealing with that. We're just going to continue to move forward. Um, just to know, Pastor Mark, I'm, I'm actually checking out the uh, the live feed, and I see you, but I don't see myself. But that's fine. We'll keep on going. Well, I see you. Oh, you see me now? Okay, now I switched yeah. over. Okay, cool, yeah, cool beans. All right, yeah, all right, so, all right. So get all right. We think. Oh, okay, cool. I I I, I want to just say first off, just to, just to connect with the concept of forgiveness. As the Pastor Mark made it very, very, very clear. Forgiveness is forgiveness is is beneficial and it requires love. Yes. In order for you to truly be able to forgive, you have to love, and that's one of the hardest things because, as has been pointed out, a lot of us deal with the struggles of the issues that we were wronged or that we were hurt in, and we don't realize that it's not about them, it's, it's for us, it's the freeing of us. Jesus asked the Father, and this is just an add on and then we're gonna move on. Even though they don't, even though they've hurt me, even though they've all came against me, Father, 
even though they placed me in this situation that I did not deserve. And it was so it would be so easy to send down your angels and destroy them all, wipe them clean. Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then we move on to the second. When he talked to the rebellious sinner and the repentant sinner, one didn't see any benefit because in his mind, you're in the same situation that I'm in. You're dealing with the same mess that I'm dealing with. How are you going to do anything for me? While the other saw beyond the vision, his physical vision and saw that this man was different from everyone else. This man was innocent. He did not belong here. And his spirit cried out to Christ. Is your spirit crying out to Jesus right now? Are you seeking to be in paradise with Christ? Or are you just seeking to get what the world has? He said, but truly I say to you, today, because of your faith, because of your faith and your trust, you will be with me in paradise. Now, I don't know about any of y'all, but I'm not trying to stay here forever. I'm trying to get what I need and go up to the Heavenly Father through Christ. But I know that that's going to require something. It's not just going to require me to sit up in church. It's not going to require me just to sit and sing. It's not going to require me to even preach as I'm doing now. It's going to require me through grace and through mercy to be faithful and to be repentant and to realize and to know that I am a sinner saved by grace. As he lay, as he hung there between you and I, now, I know that the story goes that the sinners, as they, as they did that, but no, let's look at this from where it is. Between you and me, Christ hung there. So which one are you playing? Which position are you in right now? Are you the rebellious sinner, the one that says, what can you do for me? How can you make this good for me? You laying up here just like I am. You stretched wide just like I am. How are you going to make a change in my life? Or are you going to be like the repentant sinner? Where do you pray? Are you going to look at Christ and say, Lord, I know I've messed up. I deserve this. But if you find favor in me, just a little bit, just a little bit, can you forgive and see past my sin, my foolishness, my mess? Because I want to be with you. I believe you. I have faith in you. I trust you. And I want to be with you, Father. How many of you want to be with Christ? In spite of the fact of where you are right now, that you're beaten and broken down. It's hard for you to forgive. It's hard for you to sit back there and let it go. It's hard for you to sit back there and see the road. It's hard for you to sit back there and see anything that is good in this world. Can you still see the good? when it comes to Jesus in your life, can you still say, Lord, even though I've messed up, even though I know that I belong here, even though I know that this is what I deserve, Lord, can you find a little bit of favor? Can you find a little bit of grace just for me? Or are you going to lay on the other side and give up? To continuously condemn to continuously sit back here and point your finger and then expect forgiveness, expect something. A lot of us sit back and we expect God to do what God's supposed to do in our life. We expect this. Why? Because of what we think we've done. How we've been here and there. How we've did this and did that. Well, I'm just a, I'm, I'm a super Christian. Well, Christian... As you lay, as you lay stretched wide upon your cross, who's going to bring you down? Obviously, you can't do it yourself. So who are you going to rely on? 
Right now, Christ is, stand, is laying right between us. He's hanging right between you and I. And he's giving you an offer as he's giving me. Which one will you choose? Will you choose this world or will you choose paradise? Yeah, we're going to have to suffer through this. No, it's not going to be easy. And it's going to hurt. But Jesus is saying, if you stand with me, if you hold on, will meet me, will come with me to our Heavenly Father. So can you hold on for a little while longer? Can you endure? Can you persevere? Is it worth it to you? That's the question. Is this worth it? Or do you want the easy way out? Do you want to die with your excuses? Do you want to burn in your arrogance? Or do you want to just say, Lord, look beyond my faults and see my need. And what is my need? I need you. Right here. Right now. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I feel you right now. Truly, he's saying to you, if you hold on, by faith, if you trust me, yes, you're bleeding. Yes, the nails are in your hands. Yes, you're tied up. Yes, people are laughing at you. Yes, they're waiting for you to fail. They're waiting for you to fall. They're waiting for you to be destroyed. You hold on. This day will be with Christ in paradise. Don't let the world tell you that you can't make it. Don't let the world tell you that there's no way, no how, no chance, no choice. Christ is saying right now, I'm with you. And if you trust me, we're going to make it through this. I thank and praise God for, for this phrase, for this word that he's told me, and I'm talking about me, I'm going to meet him and come with him. And we're going to rise up beyond this world, beyond all this mess. We're going to be with the Heavenly Father. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more deception. No more struggle. Live that everlasting life. All this shall be shared away and all shall pass. Word tells us that his word will last forever. Do you trust his promise? Do you trust when he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you? Do you trust when he says that I got you? Do you trust when he says that I'll be with you? No matter come what may, do you trust it? Do not rebel. This is the moment right now. This Good Friday. This is a good Friday. This is a very good Friday to repent. This is a very good Friday to choose Christ right now, right here. And allow Christ to take you to paradise. Let all that mess go. Know that his word stands true. Not just then, but right now. Yes, Lord, we thank you. We thank you. The offer still stands, people. Now, I know that we, we say the prayer of salvation at the end, but right now I'm saying the offer is here. Are you going to take it? Or are you going to rebel? All right, Pastor Mark, it's on you. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. The unrepentant sinner. He didn't even believe he was worthy to receive salvation. He didn't even believe that Jesus was able 
to grant him everlasting life. Yes. There are many who, who feel that their sin is so great that they can't even repent. Mercy, God. I'm here to tell you. That even on the cross, when you're facing the consequences of your sin, you can be like the un mean be like the repentant sinner who 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 knew he couldn't change anything in his life at that point other than turning 180 degrees from his sin to his savior. And he said to everybody else, leave him alone. Stop mocking him. Leave Jesus alone. And he said to him, in faith, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He understood the kingdom of God was on the cross suffering for you and for me. The entire. Remember me. Some people would say, well, he could get saved because he didn't go get baptized and, and all of that. No. He received a promise from God. Jesus Christ himself. He received salvation because Jesus said, when Jesus speak a word, it's just like the word in the beginning when he said, let there be and there was. He said, today, you will be with me in Paris. Oh, hallelujah. I just love that. I just love that. I just love that. That, that expression offers us hope for salvation. For if we turn our hearts and pray to him and accept his forgiveness, oh, hallelujah, we will also be with Jesus. But now, as Paul has already said, no more sadness, no more tears, no more crying, no more struggle. But every day is a day of rejoicing. Oh, hallelujah, glory to God. Let's move on now to the third word. The third word, the third word is a word about relationships. Jesus cares about relationships. And that's something that many people don't understand. They don't understand that, that this is not about religion. This is about a relationship. Listen to the words from John chapter 19, verses 24 and 27. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. That's what he told to John. Behold your mother. He made sure that his mother was being taken care of. John was the only disciple. That, 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 that wasn't afraid, or if he was afraid, he let his love overpower his fear. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and a sound mind. Oh, hallelujah. We got to get over our fears and get into our love that our relationship might grow. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus. are together again for the last time. They were together in the beginning. They were together in the beginning of his ministry. They were together end of his public ministry. Mary was there. Mary was there. Remember when he worked his first miracle in Canaan? Mary was there. Remember, can you recall what it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where, where it says that the seed of a woman 
would crush the serpent's head? Oh, yes. Mary received, along with the power of the Holy Spirit, overcome David. The, 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 the Masonic prophecy of the Redeemer anticipated the woman clothed with son in Revelation 12. Clothed with her own son. Mary was there when he fell on Villa Del Rosa's road. Mary was there when they nailed him to the cross. Mary was there when he was a child and, and Simeon the prophet told him that, that he was going, he's the one and he could die now. Mary was there. She knew. She loved Jesus, her son. But she also loved Jesus, son of God. It was her relationship with Jesus. Relationship. Then John. John is the one that he loved. Yeah. That, that, that's what the scripture said. John, John is the one that he loved. You never see John's name. In the gospel, but, but the disciple John, the apostle John, was the one that he loved. He had a deep relationship with Jesus. And when you have a deep relationship with Jesus, Jesus will tell you some things. And so we hear John say, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. And Jesus gave me this revelation because he had a love relationship with Jesus. He received an awesome revelation. This word of relationship is so important because too many people are trying to convince other people that they are to dot their I's and cross their T's. But I'm here to tell you, just like Jesus fell three times up Villa Del Rosa's road, I fall. And it wasn't my me picking myself up by my own bootstraps. It wasn't, it wasn't about me getting my life in order. It wasn't about me doing anything but calling on that one that said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That one that says, I I've sent my angels to protect you. That one that says, you're mine. It's just here. Because my sheep hear my voice. No other will they follow. So I learned that I can go to him even when I've done the worst things in the world, I can turn to him and say, and say, Lord, please forgive me. I repent. I confess my sins. And you know what? He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness because of our relationship. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, tolls and stairs, I have already come. Oh, yes. It was his grace that brought me through. That relationship. You don't understand that relationship. I want to invite you to have that kind of relationship. See, let me say it this way. Some people can talk about you, can hurt you. Care. But when somebody you love, it hurts you. But let's flip the script. When somebody does something good to you, they thank you. So 
when somebody like Jesus has done some great for you, you'll be like that woman who busted alabaster bottle and and washed Jesus' with her tears. And why did she do it? Because she has been forgiven much. And it didn't matter to Jesus that 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 she had worldly problems. What mattered to Jesus was that she loved. And I can hear him talking to Mary and Martha. Martha complaining because Mary is worshiping the Lord. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you worry about a whole lot of stuff. But Mary understood this one thing. It's just one. And that's the love relationship. So I say to you, get your relationship with him right. Be honest with him. As the kids say, be real. Don't be fake. Don't, 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 don't be trying to play him. Jesus knows everything. And if you get a closer walk with him, he'll take care of problems in your life that nobody else can fix. Not even you. Oh, hallelujah. I'm turning it back over to you, Paul. Hallelujah. Hey, man, we are just, we are just being filled with this word. It's wonderful. Wonderful. Now, we got to understand, as as, as Pastor Mark was saying, the, the basis of, of the relationship with God as we move forward into the next phase, that that it is... Do do you truly do you truly can you truly relate to this thing? I mean, a relationship with God is not like that relationship you have with people. It is much more substantial, much more at stake. Yet in this relationship that you have with God, one thing you can rest assured that the covenant that is established between you and God, God will keep his word or stand question is where do you play your part that's one of the positions that's one of the things that i've been working with in regards to to the uh seven last words of the cross where do i play my part what position do i have in this relationship hold do i just sit back and just just skate along assuming that I got it all under control that I just deserve everything that I'm supposed to get. Or am I doing my part? Am I standing by faith? Am I trusting? Because as Pastor Mark said, it ain't about what I've done. It ain't about my works. It ain't about the fact that I've pulled myself up by the bootstraps. It ain't about none of that. It is about the amazing grace. That song is a wonderful song, but really, if you really listen to it, it says this, this grace is amazing. Sound of it in my life resonates and speak. And because of that, a wretch like myself say, I was once lost. I've lost a couple of times. But each time God was there, brought me back. Now many of you right now in the in the concept of that, the concept of grace, would have let that go and been done with it. The first time, maybe. Second time, fail. Oh no, I'm done. But when you have a build building and wonderful relationship with God. God's grace is infinite. So it has to be something that we must appreciate. It has to be something that is cherished. The next one is the one that I've experienced and many of us have experienced as it comes from the book of Mark and the book of Matthew and the book of Mark, as you can see, 27, 
46 and 15:34. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? And in the old tongue, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabak, Thana. Many of you feel abandoned because of your circumstances, because of the beating down of the world. Many of us stop right here and the enemy just runs us ragged. And at that moment, the flesh had a, had a pause. And sometimes even when it seems like we're at our darkest hour, there's, and at this time it was at the ninth hour, darkness had fell. He was being mocked by the priests, the Pharisees, all those people who said to him in prior, in prior, hey, he said he could build it in three days. How you gonna save me and you can't save yourself? Come on down from that cross, Superman. This is one of the positions that a lot of people play when it comes to Christ, especially in this time, the heckler. Those that sit back here and would say, hey, if he can't do it, how can he do it for me? And to watch him at that point, at that point of weakness when the flesh cried out, and my God, why have thou forsaken me? Why have you left me here with these people? who don't care about me, don't care about you. Why must I suffer? Many times we'll look at the world. We'll look at what the world is doing, lifestyles of the rich and the famous, people that have came up in this world, cars, houses, all these wonderful things. Those of us that are laboring, living check to check, trying to make it. While we watch the world, it just seems like it just moves forward. And then those points where we just feel like we're abandoned, we ask God, help me through this. And it just seems like we're just stuck. And it seems like we're in that ninth hour, day by day by day. And it seems like God has abandoned us. It seems like right now we're stuck and we have no other place to go. And at that time, and as it says in the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why have you left me here alone? Why have you darkened the sky? so that I no longer can see you. Why does it seem like every time I try to move one step, I go back two, three, or four? I've prayed to you. I've labored for you. I've preached when there was nobody else around but me. I've sung when no one was listening. I've given, I've loved when I've been hated. I've forgiven when I've been persecuted. And you see that the world mocks me right now. Where is your God at? Why don't you come down from that cross? Or as the world may ask you, why don't you just get over it? It ain't that bad. It don't seem like your prayers are working, does it? It don't seem like things are happening your way. I thought you served a mighty God. I thought your God could do anything. I thought when you tore this down, you would build it up in three days, but it's been longer than three days. It looks like it's been three weeks, three months, and nothing has changed. So the enemy comes in as he does, he tells you, God ain't for you. 
God has blotted out the sky. It's almost done. The day is almost done. And where is your God? Many of you right now feel completely abandoned. You may not say it. You may smile when you come to the church. You may laugh with the others. You may even sing in the choir. You may come and raise your hands, come to the altar. You may even stand in the pulpit and preach, preach, preach. You're still stuck in that abandonment because it seems like God has blotted out the skies in your life. You got to remember that the word of God does not turn away void. At that moment, there is those moments where we all have that moment of weakness. Every one of us that labor, a time when we feel like it makes no sense. What am I doing this for? You have to see what Christ was going through at that point. Prior to this, he loved unconditionally. He shared, he fed, not just physically, but spiritually. Even when they walked away, even when they mocked him, even when they wanted him dead, he still brought life. He still healed. He raised from the dead you and me. They didn't ask us for anything except one thing that we barely can do. He said, all I want you to do is love. Just love your brethren. Share that love and we are good. But no, no, come on down to that cross, buddy. Prove to me that you can really do this. Then we, when, when we lay upon our cross, hang upon our burdens, hang upon our sorrows, hang upon our, upon our doubts, hang upon our confusion. And all we can see is the clouds. Can't see the promise. We forget about the promise. He said it would never leave us. He said it would never forsake us. And in that moment, we speak in the old tongue. Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. Why did you leave me here? What did I do to deserve this? Can you see it? Can you see Christ up there right now, looking towards the heaven with tears in his eyes, blood running down his face, body broken for you and for me, trying to hold on, Seeing that the hour is coming and saying, my God, I did what you said, trusted you. Why? Why have you left me here? And then ask yourself this question. You really and truly believe God left you? Really, truly believe God forsake you. When every moment that you live, every moment that you breathe is a moment of grace and mercy. So many of us have fallen by the wayside. But you say you trust the word, right? You say that you, you have faith in the word, yes? More now, Christians, truly trust the word. Or you're standing by, waiting for the axe to fall. Don't believe the hype. Yes, we all have that moment. We all have that moment of weakness, but don't believe the hype. Know that God is with you. Continually. All right, I'm going to move on. Pastor Mark. It's all on you, sir.
Psalm 22 records this verse. David recorded it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Many times when we're going through suffering as innocent people, we cry out to God like Israel cried out. Why does bad things happen to good people? We cry that. That's what Jesus was crying. Psalm 22 says that the, the, it was a prophecy that they have pierced my hands and my feet. They, they have numbered my bones. Psalm 22 says, they divided my garments among them and they and my vestige they cast lot. My God, my God, why have you forsaken? This, 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 this cannot be more a dreadful moment in history. For any man at this moment, Jesus, who came to save us is crucified and he realizes the what 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 is happening and but now he has to endure he's about to engulf in the rage of the sea of sin evil was triumphing jesus admitted but this is his hour but it's only for a moment that the burden of all the sins of humanity from beginning to end overwhelmed that humanity of Christ. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus had to feel all of the weight of our sins upon his shoulder as he as he as he was trying to breathe yeah. every time he breathed it pulled him back down breathe again and he could feel the nails he could feel the nails on his hands and the nails on his <laughs> did Jesus come down as Paul said and not even deal with this no, he couldn't. Why couldn't he come down? Because it was this hour that he came. And he loved his father. He knew that God had a divine plan for his life. It was a plan, as he told Jeremiah, a plan to not harm you, not to give you evil, but, but to give you hope and an expected end. Jesus' humanity was feeling forsaken and his spirit was feeling the weight of sin. But thanks be to God, he stayed up there. Because cause Peter picked this up and he said over in 1 Peter, the second chapter, verse 24, he himself bore our sin yeah. in his body upon the cross. Yes. So that so that, so that we are free from sin, that we might live for righteousness by his wound. We have been healed. We are already healed. That's why he had to do it. That's why, why felt so forsaken. Everything you've done wrong, everything the world has done wrong, everything I have done wrong on his shoulders. Imagine it. Jesus took it for you. All of that sin, at this point, he couldn't even. Mm -hmm. That brings us to our next point the word. Listen to John chapter 19, verse 28. I thirst. This fifth word, this fifth word of Jesus is his only human expression of his physical suffering. Otherwise, he did not complain. They said he didn't say a mumbling word about the pain. He said, I thirst. 
the wounds are inflicted upon him and the scorning and the crowd and the crown of thorns, losing blood on this third three hour walk through the streets of Jerusalem. Nails on the cross are now taking their toll. John, the Gospel of John says he thirsts. Do you remember when he met the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well? And, and, and she asked for a drink, and he asked for the woman and said, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but those who drink of the water that I give them will never thirst again. The water that I give them will become in them a spring. Oh, hallelujah. A spring, yes, Lord Jesus, of, 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 of water gushing up to eternity. That, that passage, that passage implies that, that there is more than just physical thirst. Because Jesus was the living water. Jesus was thirsty in a spiritual sense. He thirsted for God's love. He thirsted for the love of his father who had left him unaided during this dreadful time when he must fulfill his mission all along. Sometimes we got to take that step forward even through the pain, even through the even when it seems like God has forsaken us, but we know he promised he'll never leave us, nor us. So he thirsted for the love and the salvation of his people, human race, us, you and me. Jesus practiced what he preached. He said in John the chapter 15, Verses 12 and 13, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No greater love as no man than this, that he lay down his life. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I can sing that song. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing his word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, hallelujah. How I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Yes, I love him. I, I can't help it but say I love you, God. I love you, Jesus. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. You love you. I love you. And thank you for loving me first. Oh, you love me, God. While I was still in my sins, you demonstrated your love for me on the cross. I love you, God. I love you, Jesus. I love you. I love you. I love you. Anybody here love the Lord? Like the Lord loves us. Oh, I don't know about you. I love him so much because I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to oh, rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. And from those waters, he lifted me. Now safe am I. Love lifted me when nothing else would help. His love lifted. I love you, Lord. I love you. I know you're thirsty for my love. You're thirsty. You're thirsty. That's what the kids say. Look at you. You're thirsty. Yes, I'm thirsty for the love of Jesus. Jesus. 
on that cross. He didn't need something to drink. Greater, no greater love has any man than this. Lay down his life. Oh, hallelujah. Got it now, Paul. <laughs> I ain't want to even stay long on that. Woo! Hallelujah. Take it over, Paul. Amen, amen. The question is, what are you thirst for? <laughs> thirst for this world? Thirst for Christ? Are you thirst for the things of this world that will profit you nothing? Do you thirst for Jesus that will gain you everything? As for me and mine, I'm thirsty. Rise. Very thirsty. As Pastor Mark said, the, the young heads say, you're thirsty. Yes, I am. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed. I thank and praise God that as I, as I drink of his water. Won't ever thirst again. As we come close to the end, comes down to the sixth word of Christ. One of the great ones. They all are great. This is the one that brings such an everlasting hope to myself. As it said, when Jesus, Luke 19, 29 says, now there were a set of vessels full of vinegar and they filled the sponge with vinegar and put it upon his, put upon his sock and put it to his mouth. Jesus therefore had received the vinegar. He said, it is finished. Bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It is finished. Christ is saying to every last one of us that pain, suffering, all that mess is finished. He's saying, I've forgiven you. Let it go. Isaiah 43 and 25 says, I, even I am he, blotted out thy transgressions for my own sake. Not forget your sins. I will let go of your sins. But forget your sins. I will let them go. They're finished. Done. Can you let them go? Can you say, this pain is finished? God has forgiven me. Christ has forgiven me. Christ has hung, bled, and died. Has paid it all. my sake. God has blotted the transgression. I can let them go. It's finished. This is the time right here, right now. Finish with all that mess. Finish with all that pain. Finish with all that confusion. Finish with all that hurt. Truly let go and let God. To know that Christ has paid the price. He's telling you right now, he's telling every last one of us. It's finished. No more need to hold on. No more need to just continue to continue to dwell in that past. Somebody's listening. I'm talking to you. It's finished. Well, what about all this? It's finished. Well, you don't know what I've been. It's finished. You don't know what they said to me. It's finished. You don't know how they treated me. It's finished. It was my mother. She is finished. My daddy, he is finished. 
that man, that woman, whoever is finished, people. Jesus has paid the price. God has let it all go. Blotted it out for my own sake. Not remembering your mess. Christ is saying to you right now, he's saying to every last one of us, again, it's done. Move forward with me. Move forward with me. Let us go to paradise. This is all finished. All of that. No matter how bad the world may make it look, no matter how bad people may have said about it, no matter what the people in the church say, no matter what the people in your house say, no matter what the people at your job say, no matter what you're telling yourself, Jesus is telling you right now, it's finished. Let it go. Come with me. It's all blotted out. Forgotten. All of it. I pray that every last one of you that's listening or that is watching reminds yourself that God is saying to you, it's done. I got you. The sacrifice has already been made. Grace and mercy has abound within your life. I've loved you before the beginning of the world and I continue to love you right now. And in my love, there is hope. In my love, there is forgiveness. In my love, all that is done. Don't worry about it no more. It is finished. And I'm going to stop right here and let you marinate on that. Remember, it's finished, babies. Done. Let's move forward. Amen. 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 Pastor Mark, it's on you, baby. Amen. Amen. It's finished. It's done. Yes, Lord. The seventh word says, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Do you remember what Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 14? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me and my father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus talked about in that 14th chapter that living water. And he, 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 he was trying to tell us that, that, that the living water is the Holy Spirit. You remember what he said in chapter 14? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of here, but, but I'm going to send, my father is going to send another advocate to be with you, the, the spirit of truth. That word advocate, it means, it means comforter, it means helper, it means paraclete, it means comforter. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. This symbology of, of the, the water of the Holy Spirit, the, of water for the Holy Spirit became more evident on that cross. Because while he was up there and he had said these last words, Jesus cried out, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The soldiers pierced him in the side. 
and water and blood came gushing out. He gave up the ghost. And, and the spirit of God was given back to the Lord. Oh, I, that, 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 that blood. He said when when he did told us about communion, this is my blood. This is this cup of wine represents my blood. That 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 was shed on the cross for you. And then this bread is broken, and this bread represents my body that was torn apart. Then the other ordinance of the church, baptism. Baptism is the water. Baptism is the water. When you, when you go down into the water, giving up all your sins, and then you 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 you're put under the water, burying your sins. Jesus is going to get ready to be buried, child. Then you come up under that water. Resurrected into the newness of life. All things have passed away. All things have become new. That water represents God's Holy Spirit coming into your life. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Because you confessed it. Because you believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. And then you go and get baptized. Oh, yes. God, Jesus told him, say, no, that wasn't Jesus. That was John told him, say, I baptize you with water. But he that's coming after me going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. That's why Jesus said to thy hands, oh God, I commend my spirit. For the spirit and safe keeping. Because he knew that the Lord was going to be faithful with his spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Pilate could have dismissed him of his crime. Pilate could have let him go, but he didn't. He just washed his hands. But the centurion soldier that saw him when he died, said, certainly, this was an innocent man. Certainly, this was a man of God. Jesus was obedient to his father until the end. And you hear him in the garden of Gethsemane, please let this bitter cup pass me by, but not my will. Thy will be done, O oh Lord. So as we close out this word, I want you to remember, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Three more days, y'all. Three more days is Resurrection Sunday. Jesus is dead. He's getting ready to get put in the tomb and be sealed. And, 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 the, and Satan and his cohorts are jumping and they're happy because the newspaper line reads, Jesus is dead. But uh, hold on, y'all. That's not the end of the story. It's not over until God says it is over. Because three days later, he got up out of that grave with heaven and earth in his hand, with all power in his hand. Oh, hallelujah. And I want you to know every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Because God has exalted him. Everybody got to call him Jesus. Lord of lords, king of kings. Jesus, when he got up with that power, he looked at death and said, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Oh, hallelujah. 
and now we can sing. Because we trust in him, we believe in him, and we confess him as our Lord and Savior. We can sing, victory is mine, victory is mine, victory today is mine. You can tell Satan, get thee behind, because victory today is mine. I don't know about you, but I can holler and scream, joy is mine, joy is mine. Today, joy is mine. Get behind me, Satan, because joy is mine. Happiness is mine. Happiness is mine. Get behind me, Satan, because happiness is mine. I just feel like preaching tonight. Uh, victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory can be yours promise. Today. All you have to do is confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Well, as we get ready to close on Facebook, I want to pray the prayer of salvation. Let us pray. Dear Father God, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus died for my sin. Raised him from the dead. Oh, hallelujah. I repent of my sin. Please, Lord, come into my heart. Please forgive me of all of my sin. I'm the Lord of my life. Rule yes. and reign in my heart from this day forth. Please, Lord, in your Holy Spirit, rest of my life. Facebook, hope this word bless you. Seven last words. Gonna get off of Facebook. Conference call dial six one nine six three nine. Thank you. Bless you.